Hi, this is Bill, and I just want to get a quick recording up of the Sam Chad interview with the candidates, which was on March 3rd. It was the Attorney General, Treasurer, and Controller, and it was a really nice event. And I just want to thank also the Silver Sponsors would help us with this new equipment and allow us to get these presentations up. So it takes a lot of work, and uh, we're thankful for everybody. Great event. We look forward to seeing you at the next event, which will be next month, which is April the 7th, and that should be the uh, select congressional candidates. We'll interview with Sam Chad, and there will be a Senate debate. See you then. Also, this is a quick draft, and we'll have the final copies up in the next few days. Hi, I am Jan Gallicini, and I am your Washoe County Clerk. I've been in the office about six and a half years as County Clerk for almost a year and a half. I gotta tell you, it's the most fun job I've ever had the privilege of doing, serving the public. So in my office, we have basically three different divisions. One is administrative, take things to the legislature, do the budget, all that fun stuff. And then we have our business office where we issue marriage licenses, fictitious firm names, notary bonds, authorized ministers, so people starting their new lives. It's, it's like the Disneyland of the county. It's so much fun. And then we get to be word nerds in the back office, our board records and minutes division. We are the record keepers for the Board of County Commissioners, the Fire Protection District, the Debt Management Commission, the Board of Equalization, and the Community Homelessness Board. So that's a lot of writing, but we have fun with it. So. Jan Gallicini, Washoe County Clerk. My cards are over on the table. They're purple, you can't miss them. Um, anyway, Jan Gallicini, Washoe County Clerk. Jan, that was really good. Let me, let me do one mod. See, we're learning here, so we have really great shots. Move down right to here. Hello, I'm Tim Duvall. I'm running for Nevada State Senate, District 16. One thing I wanna make clear, I'm not a career politician. I'm actually a Sparks businessman. And for a number of years, I've been making and delivering and developing and manufacturing in Sparks critical care products and life-saving products for children and premature. My goal as a businessman has been to get these children healthy, send them home with their parents, let them go home, be with their grandparents, their brothers and sisters, get strong, ride a bicycle, and enjoy their and so now I want to help Nevada's children go further than they've gone. I want to get them to excel. I want to help them prosper and reach their dreams and make their parents proud. My wife, Michelle, shares that dream with me. Michelle is an RN who volunteered to be on the front line during the COVID day, first COVID days at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. She did that when no one else wanted to in that hospital. She's a wonderful person. All my friends got together. They came over. They've talked to me. They said, Tim, we want you to run. And so here I am running. And together with all of you, I believe we can make Nevada strong. I'm Tim Duvall. And I'm running for state senate. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name's Rich DeLong, and I'm running for Assembly District 26. And that district encompasses South Meadows to Incline Village, and then Verdi all the way down to the Carson City. So geographically, a relatively large district with uh, people spread out around the margins. I am a 30 plus year resident of the Truckee Meadows. Started off my career over 40 years ago in Nevada as a geologist. I've been running a, an environmental consulting firm for the past 20 plus years have um, employed a number of people um, in the Truckee Meadows as well as in the, the rural counties um, as part of the business, which I recently sold. The main issues I'm hearing from everyone I talk to um, and that seem to be of a big concern in District 26 are school choice, parents having um, a say in the curriculum and the schools that they go to, and then having uh, the ability to have the money follow whichever schools they go. Also, election integrity is a very big issue. So again, I'm running for District 26, Rich D. Long, and I have some flyers over on the table on the side. Thank you very much, have a good evening. 
And good evening. My name is Ken Giotto. I'm running for Washoe County Clerk. And uh, I bring to uh, the county, then hopefully this position, uh, if elected, uh, 50 plus years of work experience. I have 20 plus years of uh, military background. Uh, I was basically a moved around from unit to unit as a fixer. So any uh, units that had issues, I would be moved there to bring their ratings back up and uh, correct their budgets, correct their uh, manpower, correct the uh, attitudes within the units. And I always believed in uh, cohesion within the, uh, the team. Uh, if you don't have a happy team, then uh, you're going to have an unhappy department. I ran, uh, I was a superintendent of medical administrative services, as well as I flew an air medical evacuation, which meant that I was uh, moving, uh, I was flying um, many, many hospital patients from uh, one location to another. And thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner. It is such a pleasure to be here and see all of you tonight. I am the sitting Assemblywoman for Nevada State Assembly District 26. It's been an honor to serve you for the last six years. In the 2021 legislative session, I brought bills for our veterans, for senior citizens, for persons with disability, for human trafficking victims, for children, and for the building and construction industry to create affordable housing and jobs for people. I voted no on SJR 8 that lets men compete in women's sports. I voted no on the big mining tax. Thank you. I voted no on the bills that erode your Second Amendment rights because I am endorsed by the NRA with an A rating. I also voted no on same-day voter registration, universal mail-in ballots, and ballot harvesting. I have the experience that we need. I've served for six years, hardly a career politician, but it still gives me the experience that we need in the state Senate. It's been an honor to represent you, and I want to continue to represent you. At the end of December, I served on the Ledge Commission. This is an interim committee. I was one of six Republicans that blocked Governor Sisolak's vaccine mandate for the state of Nevada. <laughs> and just this week on the Ledge Commission, all the voting regulations came before us, including voting by email and changing it from citizens can vote to the word person can vote. Only two of us voted no, Lisa Krasner and Jill Dickman. Yes, that's right, standing up for your election integrity, which is my number one platform issue. I need your help, I need your support, and I need your vote. My website is lisakrasnerfornevada.com. I'm Lisa Krasner, I'm running for Nevada State Senate District 16. Thank you and God bless. Ray wants me to say where 16 is. Senate District 16 encompasses Incline Village, South Reno, Washoe Valley, and Carson City. Good evening. I'm Matt Bueller, and I'm running for Nevada Senate District 13. And what comprises that is primarily inside McCarran. It goes as far west as Sharon Lane and all the way to the western edge of Hidden Valley, and then north to about McCarran and south to about McCarran. So it's a large area there, mostly Reno Sparks, uh, metropolitan, if you will. And um, so I'm running for that. I am a 22 and a half year uh, Air Force veteran. I retired in 2014. And my goal is to represent you to be your voice in the state Senate. Uh, election integrity is a big issue for me. I want to make sure your, your voice, your legal voice is heard, and those who are not legally eligible to vote don't vote. Um, so we will make that happen, hopefully. Uh, uh, other, other issues I want, improve education. We need to definitely improve the way we teach our children, 
and uh, get their standing up in our, in our state and nation. I don't like unilateral mandates. I think that if a governor comes down in an emergency and says there is a mandate, whether it's uh, uh, having to do with civil unrest or, or um, medical issues, they should have 30 days to take care of an emergency. After that, it's no longer an emergency unless they can get some corroboration and, and by uh, a vote of the legislature. I'm proposing that, that if they want to extend a mandate, they need two-thirds of each house of the legislature to extend it for another 30 days and every 30 days that they want to do that. Um, I hope you'll uh, visit my website. I've got my new literature over there on the tables. My website is BuellerFORNV.com. Thanks. Matt. Hello, everyone. My name's Colleen Westlake. I'm running for Washoe County School Board District B, which is in Sparks. Don't ask me north, south, east, or west, because I'm really stupid when it comes to that. But it's over around Reed High School, Los Altos, and going on up into Sun Valley. The important, thing, the important thing here is our children are being cheated. They are being cheated out of a future. They are being cheated out of being successful. They will not be able to support families. They will not be hireable. We're already seeing colleges saying that our youth that we're graduating are not college ready. So that means two things. High schools are failing, and also it is going to be a failure for these kids when they get to college. They will be distraught. So we have to ensure that our kids are ready to go to college or trade school. They're our most valuable asset. And if we fail them, our communities will fail. We will not have hireable employees for businesses, and we will see a decline. So please think of that. Please think of your communities and your children. It's refreshing to hear the candidates tonight speaking of how important our children are. And I think Republicans get it. I am a nonpartisan office, but I think Republicans get it. So please, please, when you go to the voting booth, Look at what the candidates stand for. Colleen Westlake, Washoe County School Board, District B. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight also. Thank you. Don't we have a great bunch of candidates? <laughs> well, I'm a commissioner in District 5, which is over 90% of our county. It's the northern 90%. <laughs> Anyhow, so and I'm the one, one vote went in all the four to one votes. I'm the one. So <laughs> yeah. I, um, I never thought I'd be asking you to help me run for a third term because I thought I could get it all done in the first. But OK, it takes a little longer than you think sometimes. But thank you all for being here, and uh, I hope this year turns out the way I'm hoping it does. Oh, I don't know. It's Gene Herman. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm glad you're all here. I wanted to share one thing with you. My grandparents came from Ukraine. So I'd all ask that you keep Ukraine in your prayers. Um, and, that's what, and that's what was said by Trump today. He said, that's what you get when you have weak Biden, Democrats, liberals, and rhinos. I'm Tom Heck. I'm running to be your next governor because I'm, te I'm tough, strong, and tested. I'm running for one single reason. Establishment of candidates have failed you every step of the way. And if you give them a chance, they will do it again. I'm running for, for an important reason is that I get stuff done. And when you go to the polls, 
the, the, the dichotomy we're having now is that the establishment is telling you to vote for the people with money. Like the previous speaker said, I encourage you, go to the websites and study the candidates. And if you go to my website, there is all kinds of things on there to show you and prove to you that I'm strong, tough, and tested and prepared to run a big bureaucracy and revolutionize Nevada government and politics. Check out Tom Heck, Heck, electheck.com, electheck.com. And if you have any doubts whatsoever, call me, 775-393-0500, and I do answer my phone. Thank you for being here. Don't forget the Ukrainians. Vote for a strong, tough, and tested candidate. Tom Heck. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everybody. What a great turnout for the candidates. I'm M. Cameron Hawkins. I'm running for lieutenant governor for the state. Is that better, brother? Okay. I'm running for lieutenant governor for the state of Nevada. Now, lieutenant governor actually does tourism. So I'm going to share something with you. We have the most read tourist magazine in the world, the Great Basin Magazine, over 2 million subscribers in my Hawkins for Nevada. We also do golf tournaments. Just a little plug here. We're doing a golf tournament in Sparks on April 29th. This is a postcard that we give. You can pick it up over here. Alyssa's at our table. And it already has a stamp on it. So when you actually look at it, you read it, then you can actually mail it to someone you respect. But um, some of the money, some of the funds we're raising is actually going to the Sparks Republican Women uh, chapter. Anybody here from the Sparks Republican Women? Yay! OK. Well, you guys are basically our beneficiary for our April golf tournament in um, Sparks. But I'm Cameron Hawkins. I'm running for lieutenant governor. And for any of you that like westerns, old shootouts, we made a nice little movie, 17-minute long movie, a little documentary in Virginia City last August. So just go to voteforhawkins.com. And right up there where it says documentary, you can click on that. And you can watch the movie. Now, the news thing over there, um, I'm in the news. Uh, actually, I wasn't protesting so much about the mask. I was protesting about freedom of choice. We can't give up our freedom of choice, just like we can't close our businesses here. Does anyone know what the lieutenant governor's job is now? It's changed. Go ahead and tell me. Not anymore. It's not a, nope, not anymore. Nope, they are no longer, they are no longer the chairman of the Economic Development Council any longer. You're right, and that's what I do. I do tourism and economic development counseling. Uh, and workshops, and we raise money for historical preservations in my own fundraisers. Huh? There you go, president of the Senate, right? She's got two. So uh, tourism, that's what I'm about. And uh, let's have a good time here tonight. Thank you very much. I think I probably went over. If there was a timer, was there a timer? I'm at the end? OK, good. So then in closing, anyone have a question for me before I sit down? Lieutenant Governor is mainly tourism now. They're the chairman of the board of the tourism department for the state. But there's also auditing and things like this, um, but no longer the chairman of the Economic Development Council. OK? All right. Well, I appreciate all of you. Hawkins, that's me. So it's voteforhawkins.com. You just saw it. And thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Melissa Clement, and I would like to say, what about these candidates, right? Okay, no, we need a little bit more. We gotta, we gotta get these folks elected, and that starts right now. It starts at events like this, but it also starts on the 12th of March. The Washoe County Lincoln Day Dinner is the 12th of March. Mark your calendars, make your reservations right away. The tickets are only gonna be available a little bit longer, so please go to washoecountygop.org. Um, the dinner is at Boomtown, tickets are $85. We've got tables for $1,500 and $2,000. This is gonna be a really fun night, and it's gonna be the start of the red wave in Washoe County, but we need money to get those, fl uh, those walk pieces. We need money to help get all of our fabulous Washoe County and state level um, officers elected. So who's going? Raise your hand. Absolutely. What was that, Sandra? Okay, 
If you're if you're if you're going, you haven't gotten your tickets. Get online, WashoeCountyGOP.org. Ray just said you cannot leave until you actually get your tickets on your phone tonight. I'm sorry, that's not me. It's Ray. Thank you. By the way, Jackie Hager has some patriotic hacks in the back, and you can meet her. There's some good prizes after the meeting. And by the way, all the candidates, Bill's telling me I got to get on the camera. Better, Bill? Anyway, I lost my trend of thought. All the candidates have their literature either on your table or on the tables back here. And after the meeting, after the meeting, go talk to them, get your opinions, and we'll have a very short question and answer. Notice the word, and Sam will tell you. Question. Not debate. All right, just a few introductions. And I hope I don't miss anybody. Mindy Elliott is with Capital Partners. <laughs> Patty Caffarata is a first woman treasurer for the state of Nevada and a bunch of other stuff, and she's an author. You can talk to her about some of her books. Hope I don't miss people. That way, Jan, there you go. You guys have all talked. Cindy Martinez is the vice <coughs> chairman for the Washoe GOP. Stand up. Sandra Lenars is the treasurer. You already met Melissa. She's also on the executive board. Huh? Nah, she votes liberal. The next is Paul Jackson. He's with the National Republican Party. But tomorrow, tomorrow is First Friday at the offices here, you know, by um, Popeyes and Cricket on uh, Facing Moana. That starts at 6, right, Paul? No, he was a... This is Alex Bonkas. And he's the Northern Nevada campaign manager for who? Joe Lombardo. Stand up. And this lady comes to so many of the events when I used to be president of Republican Men's Club. And she's with Ambassadors of Goodwill. Stand up. And her granddaughter, Cindy. Did I miss anybody? By the way, when you're mentioning candidates, we do need somebody to step up in 30 to run for assembly against Natasha, or Nadia, whatever her name is, Anderson. Super liberal. Twenty-seven and thirty. Paul, where's twenty-seven? Paul, where's twenty? Twenty-seven is a university district. By the way, all these, even if it leans. Currently, with registration a little higher with Democrats and Republicans, it doesn't make any difference. If you get out there and hustle for independents, moderates, 
That's who wins elections. Just like in 30, there's few more Democrats, but they're easily convertible to the in independents. So who's volunteering for 30? Did I miss anybody and what time? How much? Right on time. With that and being on time, Sam, we'll feed you afterwards. You and I will eat. I'd like to introduce Sam Shad. You're going to sit at that end. Sam's the host. Sam's the host of Nevada Newsmakers and um, Shad Productions, among other things. With that in mind, <clears throat> we had the treasure and controller. However, due to an issue with the campaign that they weren't happy about, they fired a scheduler, Manny Kess, that's running for treasurer, couldn't get an airline or tickets up here in time for the meeting. But it wasn't just Manny, it was two or three others. So they fired the scheduler, called me within two minutes to tell me. But with that in mind, we have Andy Matthews that's running for controller. I don't know if you remember, he used to be the director for uh, Nevada Policy Research. Andy, take your seat up here with Sam. Bill, I need the mics. Anyway, Bill wants me to reintroduce for what camera? Smile pretty. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'll introduce our interviewer and uh, Sam Shad, the host of Nevada Newsmakers and Shad Productions. And the first speaker will be Andy Matthews that's running for Nevada State Controller. Take it away, you guys. Thank you very much, Ray. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to come and uh, hold these discussions this evening. Before we get started, I just want to take a quick moment, first of all, to recognize my good friend George Harris, who is the publisher of Liberty Watch magazine. If you're not a subscriber, you should be. It's a great magazine. Can't wait to get each new issue. And they've been big supporters of Nevada Newsmakers as well. Um, I also want to recognize Mindy Elliott, my good friend, um, but especially Patty Cafferata, who, when I think about it, um, at my first event working for Channel 8 Television, um, my first political event that I attended was a Republican event, and I was greeted by Patty and her mom, Barbara Vukanovich, and the first thing they did, because they knew all reporters were poor and starving, was said, we can cover the issues later, but come get some food. And that was at John Esquaga's Nugget back in 1980. So thank you, Patty. All right, so it's Andy Matthews for State Controller. Um, you're probably the best known of the candidates here tonight, I would imagine. Um, Hope. <laughs> um, you told me that um, during an interview we did during the session, that you learned a lot during the session that you really weren't aware of, yet you have been covering politics for so long. Share with the audience what you learned as a legislator. Well, thank you, uh, Sam, and, and thank you, Ray. Um, and before I get to that, I just wanted to thank all of you for, for being here this evening and giving me this opportunity. I will warn you here at the outset, I am in the last throes of one of the worst uh, head colds I've ever had. So I'm going to try to limit the, the coughing and the wheezing up here uh, to a minimum. Uh, so just bear with me. I'll do my best. But, you know, serving in the assembly, and, and I represent Assembly District 37, uh, which is down in Las Vegas, it's been a, a great honor, a great experience. And, yeah, absolutely very, very educational. And, you know, having served as president of the Nevada Policy Research Institute prior to that, um, you do learn a lot and you observe a lot about what goes on uh, in the legislative process. But 
nothing really compares to you know what it's like to be on the inside and and a lot of um, what I learned, I think, that was unexpected, just how many different facets of state policy there are. You know, when I was at the Institute, we focused on a few core issues, you know, education policy, government transparency, fiscal policy, the budget, et cetera. Uh, but as an assemblyman, I dealt with so many dimensions to government, you know, local government issues, uh, dealing with uh, city charters and things like that, that you, you, you know, the, the typical person wouldn't even know that these are even live issues let alone issues that would come before members of the legislature. Uh, and it was very interesting um, to go through that process. So one of the things I learned as well is that, of course, you know, I'm a Republican. I'm a you know, partisan Republican, and, and I'm proud to be, uh, to be that. Um, but even with our Democrat colleagues, even though we have you know, very strong disagreements on policy, uh, there's something about going through a unique experience together uh, where you all are serving and, and really uh, being involved in that process of serving the state, uh, that really is an honor. And, and you do get to um, forge some really great relationships uh, when you're surrounded by other people who are going through something uh, and have an opportunity that, that most people don't have. So it's been a real honor. I'll miss it. Uh, but I do believe that this race for controller is the right move for me right now. Okay. So um, the first thing I want to ask you about that experience was um, you, you said that it was a different kind of experience and a shared experience. Were there areas of, of ground that you felt you could share with the other side? Or, or, or did your partisanship maintain you only being on one side? There, there are a lot of bills, and you'll see when you look at the voting record, there are a number of bills, probably more than I would have expected, that do just get voted through both houses you know, unanimously because they're either bills that just clean up language from a, a bill passed in a, pr a prior session or something that helps with implementation bills that are, are non-controversial. Um, there were a couple of areas where I felt there was an opportunity to really forge a uh, bipartisan consensus. Uh, and in some of those cases, we actually came up a little bit short. And if you'll just indulge me for a few uh, moments here, I'll tell a story that I thought was very illustrative about some of the problems actually in Carson City. You know, I had a bill, uh, one of my first bills that I introduced early on in the session which was a good government transparency bill. And this was a bill that would have actually strengthened penalties uh, on those who failed to comply with public records requests. So I've always been a big uh, believer in, in government transparency. It's a big part of why I'm running for controller. It's our money, and we deserve to know uh, what our state government is doing with it. But we see so often that, that lots of times government agencies really drag their feet when it comes to complying with public records requests. And the penalty structure is just simply insufficient to really compel that kind of compliance. And so I had a bill that would have actually stiffened the penalties in cases where you know, government officials don't comply with those public records requests. And this is a bill that came to one of my committees, a Committee on Government Affairs, and we introduced the bill. And I started whipping votes because you know, we're the minority party, and I knew if I was going to pass this, I needed Democrats. So we were able to hold the five... Republicans on the committee together, and in outreach to a lot of my Democrat colleagues, I had at least three Democrats who were ready to vote for that bill and, and actually go ahead and uh, pass this bill out of committee. Well, the bill never ended up getting a vote, and I don't know exactly uh, what led to that, but from those in the building that I talked to, my understanding is that you know the leadership in the, the Democratic Party basically decided you know this bill is not going to come out of that committee. And this is a bill that, I mean, who can be against government transparency? I don't care if you believe in bigger government or smaller government, we should all be able to get behind the principle of open and accountable government. And this was a good bipartisan issue that we had the votes. And because of some of the, I think, institutional um, inertia, some of the resistance to accountability, you know, that bill came up short. Um, I do hope that someone will bring it back in the next legislative session. But that was a, an exi you know, kind of a long way of saying there were opportunities where I sought you know, bipartisan cooperation. And in this, we had some successes. We just didn't get across the finish line. But it's a worthy, um, a worthy effort, and we'll keep it going. Um, as we're looking at the potential for a red wave, similar to what we saw in 2014, um, wouldn't it make more sense for you to continue your career in the assembly rather than jumping to another race? Well, you know, like I said, it, it has been an honor to, to serve in the assembly. And, um, you know, and if somebody were to tell me tomorrow, hey, you're, you're going to continue to be an assemblyman for, for some time, 
you know, that's an experience I have no doubt I would continue to enjoy. Um, I have always said that I will do whatever I feel like I can to best advance the principles that I believe in. You know, liberty, limited government, government transparency, defending the Constitution. And I believe, you know, state controller is just a very, very important office. And I believe that we have an opportunity uh, as a party this year, you, like you said, with a red wave uh, potentially coming, although I want to stress, we cannot take that for granted. We've got an opportunity. We are going to have to earn it, so get ready. Um, but I think having a proven principal fiscal conservative in that controller's office um, is going to be very, very critical. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's an office that we should overlook. I know it's not an office that gets as much attention as some of the other statewide offices like, you know, governor, lieutenant governor, even attorney general and some others. But it's a critical one, you know, when it comes to watching the money. And um, with a lot of encouragement from supporters and friends of mine, um, I gave it a lot of thought and decided it's the right move for me. Um, let me ask you one last question on that legislative service. What do you feel you accomplished in those four months in Carson City and what's happened since? Well, I, I think I did start some important discussions on some, on some critical issues, especially, you know, government transparency. Look, I'll be honest, I, I had a couple of bills, you know, when I was running. One of my first bills was a bill to undo um, all of the uh, election policy reforms that Democrats forced on us in that special session last summer or two summers ago now, universal mail-in balloting and ballot harvesting. I thought that those were terrible reforms. I had a bill that would have undone that. Now, I knew that there was a very good chance that given the balance of power in the legislature that Democrats were probably not going to move that bill forward. And that was okay, you know, because I wanted to get that on the record and, um, and make sure that people knew where I stood on that and get that bill as part of the discussion. But what I was able to do on government transparency and at least bringing that bill forward having a hearing, getting some bipartisan support, even though we didn't ultimately get it across the finish line. You know, a lot of times, and you know this, Sam, and others know this, sometimes efforts take multiple legislative sessions to really um, see the, the end result and to see success. And so I think the fact that we were able to get a good bill on transparency, to get a hearing, and at least start an important discussion, and know now that there are opportunities to reach out to Democrats people in the other party to get bipartisan support, you know, I think that's something that can really um, pay dividends for our state and, and help protect our taxpayers down the road. So um, I think if, if I can be remembered for one thing during my, my term in the legislature, it's, it's moving the ball forward at least on that really critical issue. Um, if you will, share with the audience, because some of us who are political junkies, you know, know exactly what NPRI is. Uh, but others don't. So give us a little background on yourself and uh, what you were doing before you got into the actual active role of politics. Sure. Um, so I, I served as president. So the Nevada Policy Research Institute, I know some of you are, are familiar with the group, some are not. It's basically a you know, free market think tank. So if you know groups on the national level like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, American Enterprise Institute, it's sort of like that, but for the state. And we basically conduct research and analysis and put forward, I say we, I'm not with them anymore, but recommendations on state policy. And we focused, we focused, they still focus on a number of key areas, like I said, uh, taxes and fiscal policy, the state budget, education reform. Um, at times we would actually bring lawsuits against government entities when they would violate the Constitution. Government transparency increasingly was a big priority for the Institute. And um, I worked there for eight years total, the last four years as uh, president and CEO. Uh, great, great experience. What actually got me to step away from um, that role and actually decide to seek public office myself, and some of you will remember this, that in 2014, we had, speaking of red waves, we had a big uh, red wave year here in Nevada in 2014. Republicans swept into power, took over both houses of the legislature. We had all six constitutional offices and we got uh, from our Republicans, unfortunately, the biggest tax hike in the history of our state. And at that time, as someone who had fought so hard in the policy arena to put forward you know, fiscally responsible ideas and, and to see that opportunity we had in front of us given the makeup in our legislature, in the governor's office, and to see that agenda you know, get pushed forward, I said to myself, we need better you know, policymakers in this. We need better, more principled Republicans. And, uh, and that year, 2016, um, I actually ran for U.S. Congress against um, the then uh, state senator who was most responsible, I, I felt, for pushing that, 
that tax increase you know, through the legislature. Um, and since then, I've done a number of different things, but, but in 2020, you know, I, I, I saw an opportunity to run for state assembly um, and was uh, very fortunate to win that election in, in, a, in a tough race. But you know, my, my policy background is something that I think has served me well and will continue to moving forward. And uh, NPRI, by the way, continues to do invaluable work uh, when it comes to um, having a strong voice for all of our uh, ideals and principles in the policy discussion. So if they're not on your radar, they should be. Yes, it's a very valuable resource for the state. Okay, so out of all the offices you could have chosen to run for, why state controller? Well, there were 37 people running for governor already. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, it's actually 38 now. I think, I think you know, I, I, I think it, it was an opportunity where I looked at, you know, my background, my skill set, and where the need was and what, and what the office does. And by the way, you know, for those who aren't familiar, because I know the controller's office um, isn't as high profile as a lot of others, but you perform a number of uh, important functions. You basically serve as the chief fiscal officer for the state, you administer the state's accounting system, you um, process transactions on the state's behalf, you're involved with you know, debt collection. Um, one of the things you can really do, um, because you are you know, in one of the, the core money offices, is you can bring a lot more oversight and exposure to what's going on with government spending. For example? Well, so, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So one of the things that I think I can do and look forward to doing is because you know we're the ones who are, are watching the books, who are hand, hand, you know handling the books. We know where the money is going, and so I see this, and I, I saw this as a, as an assembly member. Every two years, when our state legislature gets together, we hear the same thing from Democrats, which is you know we don't have enough revenue coming in. We need to raise your taxes because we'd like to spend more money. And I think what we could really use is somebody there in that controller's office who can say you know time out. Before we start going to taxpayers and demanding more, let's have a conversation about some of the things that government is already spending money on because I think most people aren't aware. In fact, even as an assemblyman, it's, it's really difficult you know, to really get down to the details and the nuts and bolts on what's happening with state spending. And like I said, whether you believe in bigger government or smaller government, we, we ought to have more accountable and open government and we ought to be able to have an informed discussion when we have these policy debates over do we need more tax revenue? Um, do we need uh, to actually cut taxes in some areas? Is government spending too much? Is the government spending too little? So with my background at MPRI, you know, dealing with the state budget and doing a lot in the realm of government transparency, um, filing public records requests, putting information out there for the public to see on where their money is going, you know, it's great to have a group like MPRI doing that. I think that our state government ought to be more proactive in doing that on the front end, you know, and making sure that um, we're there to answer questions, we're there to provide a little bit more sunlight on what's going on so that, you know, um, if we can find some, some examples of some waste and abuse, um, maybe expenditures that are questionable, you could bring that to light. Whatever your opinion is ultimately going to be on that, I believe that the citizens deserve to know what's going on. Uh, why don't you think that that has really happened before with the controller's office? Uh, I don't know. You know I, I, I think that um, you'd have to go and ask some of, the, some of the, the previous controllers. I do think one controller who did do a, a good job in that regard, uh, Ron Connect was um, the, uh, the controller prior to our current controller. He took office in early 2015. And Ron actually did a couple of, of really important things. He actually provided a link uh, on the controller's homepage to the uh, transparency website that NPRI administers, which I thought was nice. But one of the things that Ron started doing, uh, which I would, would like to bring back, is he started doing, he, publishing uh, what was called the um, Controller's Annual Report. Uh, every year, you, you, the, the Controller's Office does what's called the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual uh, Financial Report, uh, which is very weedy, very, you know, the nitty gritty and, and very detailed and, and it's, it's not the kind of thing that's easily digestible for your typical citizen. And what Ron started doing is he published something that was something much more in layman's terms and really uh, doing a easily digestible 24, 25 page report on what's going on with state spending, but more importantly, what are the trends year over year? You know, what are we spending now compared to where we were? And what are the implications of that? Where are we spending the money and what are we getting in terms of you know, return on investment? One of the things that Ron um, and his team found when he was in the controller's office 
was that he tracked um, education spending, you know, year over year. And he found that we were seeing just an explosive increase in per pupil inflation adjusted spending. If you go back the last 60 years, we've actually tripled it on an inflation adjusted basis. But test scores in Nevada were remaining flat. You know, we weren't seeing any increase in student achievement in return for all of that investment. Now, policymakers can take from that what they will and decide what they want to do. That's ultimately up to the legislature and, and others to, to decide. But I just thought that was such a valuable contribution to the debate for citizens and taxpayers to know, look, we've been increasing our public investment in this area. We're not really getting anything in terms of increased achievement. Let's start to ask some questions about why that is. And so that's an example of where a previous controller, I think, did do a good job in moving the needle. I think we, can, we have a chance to take that a little bit further. I certainly do want to bring that, that annual report back. And, and I think what I can do is actually promote it a little bit better. Um, I think for all the great work that they did there um, in that office, I don't know that that report always got the exposure that it deserved. So what I look forward to doing is continuing to make that information public, but then coming to events like this one and going on hopefully you know, shows like yours and other venues and really starting to raise public awareness of what's happening with, with um, government spending. Does it concern you uh, the limited amount of places there are uh, for a person like the controller to actually go and get out that message? Because it seems like it continues to shrink. Um, certainly, look, anyone who runs for public office always wishes they had a bigger, uh, a bigger stage, right, and, and, and more reach. But I also think it's, it's what you put into it. You know, we've got a, a big state. It's a great state. It's a wonderfully diverse state in many, many different ways. And um, I like being out in, in our, our different communities. And it's not just, you know, it's not just um, Republican or conservative groups that I think need to hear that message. It's local chambers of commerce and other you know, civic or, civics organizations locally uh, meeting with local officials and, and finding out from them, you know, what's going on in your office, what's going on in your community. So I, I think that, that you can bring more exposure to it if you're willing to, to put in the effort. Uh, I'm someone who's always been comfortable you know, doing that and going out and, and speaking with, with citizens and doing media appearances. And um, I hope to use, if I have the honor of, of holding this office, to use that platform to bring more attention to what's going on. And, and um, I think I've got a pretty good track record of success when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, and you are a very good spokesman. Um, let me ask you this, um, and it's not a critical question to the controller's office, but just a general question, which is with the amount of federal money that is flooding, flooding, literally, into the Silver State, um, what do you think about it? Well, I, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because I think it's, it's, it's the reason that government transparency becomes more important now than ever. I mean, you're absolutely right. We're, at a, we're in a situation now where we've got unprecedented amounts of money that are going to be flowing into state coffers and then going out. And a lot of it's going to be happening very, very fast. And a lot of it's going to be allocated not through the legislature as a whole, but through you know, the interim committee process, which is a whole other discussion I, I, won't, I won't get into. But I've got some real concerns about that. And so... Uh, yeah, we have time. Yeah, well, well we, Manny's uh, not here. <laughs> I guess that's true, right? The, the stage is all mine. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, making sure that as these dollars are being spent and allocated that, you know, the people of our state have answers to the question that they're naturally going to have about, you know, what are we doing with it and what are we getting in return for that? Because anytime you start talking about, you know, you know billions with a B that are going to be going out there, the money we've never had before, you want to be responsible you know, with that. I understand there's a process and that this, these are dollars that need to be allocated, but we all deserve to know where it's being spent and what we're getting for a return in, on investment in that. And that's something over the next four years, if I'm in that office, we're going to have to keep a very, very close eye on that. So, you know, I've always been uh, a fiscal conservative. Anytime we start talking about spending massive sums of money, you know, my, that just makes my skin crawl. Um, automatically, I can't stop it, you know, that from happening. That's not my role. But what I can do is help, you know, Nevadans understand what's, what's happening with it, because I believe we all deserve to know. What do you think about the correlation between raising the minimum wage, which has occurred naturally beyond whatever was in statute, um, and the inflation that we're dealing with now? Well, I, I think when you, when you artificially, when, when, when I think the best way I can put that is when government 
artificially drives up the costs of things, you know, in a way that, that, that isn't, doesn't correlate with market dynamics, you're going to end up with unintended co consequences. I think the biggest driver of what's going on with inflation now is, has been this out of control government spending. I don't think there's any, any question about that. And I, I think people are, are seeing that every day. I mean, one of the things about inflation and one of the reasons I think it, it, as terrible as it is, it gives all of us an opportunity uh, who are running as Republicans this year is these are dots that are very easy for, for citizens to connect. You know, and, and it, these are issues, these, you know, they call them the kitchen table issues. You know, you don't have to be somebody who's all that interested in politics to know that you're paying, you know, a dollar more for, for gas, you know, at the pump than you were in, in, the, in the recent uh, past, or you're paying more for groceries. Um, you can feel that you know, every single day. And I think that, you know, lots of factors go into an infl to inflation, but I think the out of control spending we're seeing under this administration is a big part of it. And, you know, in terms of minimum wage, um, you know, I think similarly, you know, the, the more government mandates higher costs, you know, to a business. If, if businesses want to pay higher wages, um, more competitive wages, then, then that's great, and I'm all for that. But anytime you raise the price of something, in this case labor, that's going to have to come from somewhere. So we, talk, we hear all this talk about, you know, a, a $15 minimum wage, a $20 minimum wage. Well, if you're at minimum wage worker and you just got a, a raise to $20 an hour, if you're one of the fortunate ones lucky enough to keep your job, who didn't get laid off because your employer can now afford fewer workers, well, you're going to be paying higher prices elsewhere because the place you go down the street to shop, they've got to pay their workers more now and they've got to recoup those costs somehow and a lot of times they're going to pass it on in the form of higher prices. And so you end up with a lot of these market distortions. Um, and so you know, I, I've just always been a big believer in, in free markets. Um, and and the, the more government intervenes, I think the more you see some of the awful consequences that we're seeing right now. And I do want to point out, and it may not be popular, but um, the, the money that's been flowing into the economy has come from both a Republican and a Democrat. So. Yeah, and, and like I said earlier, one of the reasons I decided to run you know, for office initially was because, you know, I got, I got tired of, of Republicans oftentimes acting like, like Democrats and, and, you know, taxing us and spending us. And, you know, I, I say all the time, it's great, you know, we all want to elect Republicans, but it's not enough just to have the R next to your name. I think we really need to be uh, supporting candidates who have demonstrated a commitment to conservative principles. Um, I've got a background of having done that, and I think it's one of the reasons that my campaign is, is uh, drawing so much support. And that's where we have to leave it. Andy Matthews, thank you so much. Can I, can I plug your... the website real quick? Absolutely. All right. So andyfornevada.com if you want to get involved and learn more. Andy, F-O-R spelled out, nevada.com. Again, Andy Matthews running for controller. Be honored to have your vote. Sam, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Safe journey home. And the controller's position is important because it involves our money and with the money coming in, from the federal government, it's going to be important to control it. I think he's a pretty good candidate, don't you? We'll take a few minute break, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll have Bill Hochstetter come up. Sam. And so that people can really pay attention. George? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to always come up north. Yes, I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, but I am a rural person. I own a ranch in Heiko, Nevada. My brother and I have about 600 head of cow. Yes, I have been on a horse. And yes, I'm old. <laughs> Listen, um, I had a birthday. I'm old. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I'm over 65. And I'm lucky enough that I, I got a lot of money, more than most, less than a lot. And I got frustrated when they cheated in the last election. And they did cheat. Okay? And I don't care what anybody tells you. There's a book called Rigged. If you don't get my magazine, Liberty Watch magazine, come up to me and I'll get you a free one-year uh, subscription. And there's a book called Rig Rigged by Molly Hemingway, and she explains exactly how they did it. And here's some of the things they did. 
thousands, tens of thousands in Clark County, Nevada, over 40,000 ballots were sent to the post office after election day. And they were on ballot pallets. And how do I know this? Because we have people that have told us this. And those pallets were put over to the side. No one touched them. And somehow, one night on graveyard shift, all those ballots were ran through, dated before election day. And they ended up at the election department, and they were all counted. Okay? The other thing these folks love to do is they sent out all these, all these mail-in ballots. Okay? This guy named Justin Jones, he's a Clark County commissioner, forced, he caused a lot of aggravation and angst and said, we need to send out ballots to every person in the primary. So they sent out ballots in Clark County to every person in the primary. And guess what happened? 95% of those ballots came back. And then Joe Gloria, the county registrar of voters, he, he got COVID. So he never purged the voter file. Well, 90 days before a federal election, you cannot purge the voter file. So all those ballots got mailed out again. But something happened on the way to the coffee shop. 98% of them got voted. That's how they did it, okay? So a friend of mine, Colonel David Gibbs, is a retired colonel, Seagal Chada, Sam Brown, Annie Black, and you guys, I can't, Joey Gilbert, all these guys have been sending me their, 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 uh, um, their volunteers to help collect signatures, okay? And this is a massive undertaking because the Democrats have written the law, and Andy here will tell you, they're good at changing all the laws. We have to collect 40,000 signatures from every congressional district. Let me put that in perspective for you. Last time, if you, wanted to do an, if you wanted to redress your government and you wanted to have petition signed, you just did a petition and you sat out in front of coffee shops. But now there's got to be 40,000 from each congressional district. So they keep making, it, it's just a higher and higher and a higher and a higher pallet. So I put some money together and put it in a pot for David. He started an organization called RepairTheVote.us, RepairTheVote.us. Go take a look. If you want to help, let me know. I've got, I've got petitions here tonight if you want to sign them before you leave. I appreciate you guys. And the only thing we can all do together is fight these guys because they're going to cheat every opportunity they get. That's all I'm telling you. Okay? Right? It's like what the, what, what the CEO of Coke say. Do you remember that story? Do you guys know this? It's a, it's a two-second story. They were... They were bottling, or they were canning Coke cans, and the guys on the line weren't paying attention, and a rat called it, crawled into a Coke can. And when quality control pulled the cans off and opened the cans, they found a rat head in the can. And everybody got fired, the CEO had to come in. Do you know why? Because when that happens, it's bad for the brand. When we don't pay attention to the Democrats and what they're doing to us, it's bad for the Republican brand. So all you people in here tonight are officially elected quality control agents for the Republican Party. Because if we don't do this, no one's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Now the next candidate is running for U.S. Senate. Bill Hawksetter, his, his face is up on, huh? All right. Bill Hawksetter. All right. Sam, take it away. I did. The next candidate is Bill Hawksetter. His, his mug's on the screen. All right, so now we move on to Bill Hawksteadler. 
from Knight County. He's running for United States Senate. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir, and to meet you. Thank you. Good to be here. We, we talked on the phone, uh, had a little bit limited amount of time there. Um, but let's start out with, you know, obviously you know as well as I do that most of the people in the state don't know who you are. And so let me give you a few minutes to explain to folks who you are and how you came to be here. Sure. So my name again is Bill Hochstedler, and I'm, I'm running for the United States Senate. Um, let me give you a little bit about background. I think it's just uh, worth doing that for a couple minutes just to clear the air as to who I am. So I'm a healthcare executive with the Mayo Clinic out of Rochester, Minnesota. The reason I'm in Nevada is Mayo Clinic wanted a West Coast VP. I could have picked any state, anywhere west of the Mississippi. I decided to pick Nevada because I believe Nevada represents the, the values that I feel are important to me. It's a, a state that represents freedom. If you look at our rural counties, I live in a rural county, I live in Nye County. I don't live in the cities. I do go to the cities quite a bit, and the requirement is that I live an hour from an airport. So I live in Pahrump, Nye County, which is exactly an hour from the airport. So I fill that requirement, and I live where I want to live. Nye County is more free than Clark County, more free than Washoe County. I decided to live in, in Nye County, so that's why I'm in Nevada. The, you probably also want to know that, and I hope I'm not taking one of your questions, you probably want to know the reason I'm running. I didn't decide to run for U.S. Senate until the very last minute. Uh, although we do our filing officially uh, next week, I file on Monday the 7th at 10.30 a.m. The, uh, the idea to get into the race and file with the FEC and start doing the, the reporting and, and gathering of funds and, and expenditures, I decided to do that after I saw the other three candidates that were running. There's nothing wrong with the other three candidates. They're just quite a bit younger than I am. I have a, a few more revolutions around the sun, and I can look at the audience here and the demographics and know who votes in our primary elections and Republican primaries tend to be the older voters, and I wanted to give an option for that to appeal to people that want a little bit more experience in Washington, D.C. than what we might potentially get. The other reason is that if we, if we miss this opportunity to put the right candidate through the primary, we will lose, potentially lose that, re that Republican seat to Catherine Cortez Masto. I feel that I have a very good chance at beating her in the election, in the general election, if I should be so fortunate to get there. So just based on age and experience. And then the other thing I will mention is that I, I, I grew up at a time when uh, decorum and civility and politics in our homes and our churches and our business was a different place back in the days when I grew up as a kid. My father would have been 100 years old last October if he was still alive. So I feel that I'm a product of the greater generation. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. I, I, I got some of that information from my father and my mother that helps me live my life to get to where I am today. So I have a model for, of success and a little bit of experience to bring to the party. Um, would you share with us your military background? You were in the Army and the Air Force for 12 years? That's correct. So I started off in the Jimmy Carter administration, if you guys remember that far back, in the Army Reserves. I also registered to vote as a Republican. My father was an independent because he was a newspaper man, and he had to remain as an independent for that object objectivity. But my grandfather was a Republican and a good businessman. He owned a factory that made mattresses. And I always saw him carrying a wad of bills in his pocket all the time. I said, Republicans are rich. And I think the Republicans do have that entrepreneurial spirit and that capitalism about them. And it appealed to me. And I, I, I learned a lot from my grandfather and my father. And I wanted to be a Republican. So in the Jimmy Carter administration, while in the Army Reserves, I joined the Republican Party and voted for the first time for Ronald Reagan. I've been a 42-year lifelong Republican ever since, and I don't, I don't regret it one moment. I'm a conservative Republican. I do have some middle road tendencies, but, um, but that's because of the, of the, I've lived in a lot of places, I've seen a lot of things, the diversity of my military career taking me everywhere. So then I went to the active duty Air Force, and I became an imagery interpreter, satellite reconnaissance work. I worked with the Air Force Electronic Warfare Center, which taught me a lot about national defense and the things that, that happened behind the scenes, things I can't tell you about, you know the story. Um, but I was also appointed as the Air Force liaison to the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. And that couldn't be more important than what we're facing today when we're talking about our work with our NATO nations, our foreign partners, and keeping America secure and helping the world stay safer. So the, everything that I learned while I was at the DIA applies today, even though it's dated material. I had top secret security clearances, and I had access to, to our goals and objectives as a nation and what we could do to keep our nation safe and our world safer. So that applies to what we're doing today with the, what you see going on overseas. So let me ask you about that. Um, you know, with what's happening, we're seeing it unfold on television, on social media, uh, with Ukraine. And what do you think about what's happening there and the United States' response to it? 
Well, I think that we missed an opportunity when President Biden took military options off the table several weeks ago before we got into the negotiations and the failed negotiations with, the United, with Russia. Um, I don't say military options in the fact that we necessarily need to have troops on the ground in Ukraine to protect uh, against the Russian invasion. However, taking it off the table does take it off the table, and therefore you are forced into a different posture if they don't think that you might use military force. So I would have rather seen us keep military force, at least in their minds, not necessarily boots on the, on the ground. But again, think back in the, in the times when we did put boots on the ground. I was in the first Gulf War, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and we put over 500,000 people on the ground in Saudi Arabia to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And if you think about the fact that America is a standard of the world, people look at America for guidance. They look at us for advice. They look for us to do the right thing. Americans always do the right thing, and that's what we're known for. And if it's unwarranted aggression against a, a, a country that's a sovereign nation that needs to keep its sovereignty, then the, America is the last line of defense when it comes to things like that. Now, I recognize Ukraine is not a NATO nation. I recognize there's corruption in Ukraine. There's corruption in Russia. There's corruption in the United States. And there's a lot going on with all of that. There's some things behind the scenes that even, that, well, but there's a lot of things that we don't understand about what's going on with corruption. And uh, you have to look, 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 look no further than the Biden administration to know what's happening with Ukraine and some of the mixed up uh, ramifications that all of that has caused us. So I think that our posture now working with the NATO nations and keeping them secure, that's the new last line that we have to hold. And it's going to be a tougher job for us. I think if we kept military options on the table, at least psychologically, they wouldn't have moved as aggressively as they'd done. And if we physically had boots on the ground, I truly believe there would not have been a shot fired or not a single drop of blood shed. Now we have civilians in Ukraine that are, that are wounded and shot. We have destruction beyond your imagination. We have Russian soldiers that are shot. They have brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, and children back at home, too. They're regular people. They're not the government of Russia. It's the government of Russia, and Putin in particular, that's the problem for this world. How do you think this is going to end? It's going to end badly. In what way? I think there'll be more destruction in Russia, or excuse me, Ukraine. I think that the Russians will end up succeeding. They have, the, they have the leverage on their side to succeed in Ukraine. We have to hope that we can stop it there so it doesn't go any further. We don't want Moldova or Romania or, or Poland to fall. Uh, we, have, we absolutely have to protect that. And the reason is, if we don't protect that, then China and all the other nations that are bent on the destruction of America will continue to pursue the destruction of America by doing their own agendas with Taiwan or what's North Korea want to do or what's Iran want to do with Israel. So we've almost missed the boat on correcting this and righting this ship. We have to make sure that the world knows that America stands with its allies and that we're strong. And that's the final line on that. Okay, so I, I, do, I do have one more question regarding this. And the reason I ask these questions is because if you plan to be a United States senator, then you will be involved in these kind of issues to the nth degree, more so than you were involved in any other part of your career. So even though the United States does not have boots on the ground, um, do you not believe that the United States is fully involved in what is occurring? Well, there, there is some involvement. There, we, we do have some, I would say, let's just say there's some blood on our hands by not predicting this sooner or reacting to it quicker. So I'm not going to say that the United States is, is innocent in any way on, on the things that are happening in Ukraine with Russia. We've, we've had the opportunity to do diplomacy before it happened. The problem is, is that Putin is not a person to be trusted. We can negotiate with him and then it might go good for a couple of years and then that negotiation gets forgotten. Look at what happened with Ukraine when they gave up all their nuclear weapons back in 1993. I would think it was 1,200 nuclear weapons that they had given up. And they thought that they were safe. They thought they were secure. They thought they would be able to continue their country and look at where we're at today. So I think there's lots of fingers to point. I don't point everything at Russia. I don't point everything at Ukraine or the United States. I think there's a lot of blame to go around for everybody. And that's the unfortunate part of a war like this. We have to do a better job of predicting and using our intelligence to figure out what's going on. In the, and it, it's hard to figure out what's going on in the mind of a dictator and a ruthless thug and a murderer. So we have to be able to predict these things and react to them in a different way. Okay, but I do want to go back to my original point, which was, do you not believe that the United States, behind the scenes, is fully involved 
in what's happening with NATO and the opposition to what's happening in Ukraine from the Russians? Well, if I understand you correctly, you're asking if I believe that the United States is fully engaged with NATO to prevent? Yeah, d that, that we are not just sitting on the sidelines, oh, that we yes, are actively yeah. involved in doing our best to take care of Ukraine Absolutely. against the Russian Yeah, we effort. are providing aid, we're providing humanitarian aid, we are providing weapons and some defense items that, to Ukraine to help, them, to help them defend themselves. What we have to hope doesn't happen, and this is a complicated part, we send over a bunch of Stinger missiles, and if, you, if Russia is successful, then does that mean Russia has the Stinger missiles? That's a very complicated equation to come up with. But I do know that we're helping our NATO nations. We have those Article 5 treaties that are in place, and we have to, we have to uphold those. All right, so let's move on to uh, things closer to home. Um, as you mentioned, you had your choice of anywhere you wanted to live. You picked Knight County, which is a great place to live. Um, for all it represents um, now to leave and go to Washington, D.C., my first question, I guess, really is, why are you shooting for the top job? You could serve on a county commission. You could serve in the legislature. There are lots of opportunities, some that would allow you to remain, for the most part, in Nye County. Why choose the top job? Well, I, I will still remain in Nye County, and I'll, I will do my job in Washington and come back to Nye County, not just to represent or, or be in, in Nye County, but to represent all Nevadans. Let me point out that I'll represent everybody in Nevada, and, and I'm not going to be your leader. Lead, I will lead in Washington with the, my peers in Washington, D.C., to get things accomplished. And the whole idea is to get more done and, and create less problems. So do more than the problems you create, and, and I want to do that. But also to represent all Nevadans equally, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, or nothing at all, uh, regardless of your differences, your religious differences, and, and all of the other things that make us different people, I want to represent everybody equally. But the, the reason to go to the top of the ticket to get to your original point was that I've reached a point in my life, in my stage, in my career, and all the things I've done during the military with the DIA, and what I've done, in, and we didn't even talk about what I'm doing medically, um, but uh, what, I've, what I've done in the medical career field as a, as a healthcare executive, I bring all that to bear, that experience. So I've had a few more revolutions around the sun than a few folks, and I wanted to make sure that I brought that to the top of the ticket. It's a very important job. We have to make sure that we get reliable, honest, ethical people in Washington, D.C. to represent us. Okay, so all that being said, um, you know as well as I do, and as everybody else in this room knows, um, that raising money is a very important part of this. And you have Adam Laxalt, who is raising a ton of money. Uh, you have Captain Sam Brown, who has been raising over $2 million already, and certainly seems to be well on the way to getting a lot more. Um, are you going to be able to be competitive with those folks? Well, I, would, I don't plan on being competitive in the raising the money, and I didn't focus on it in the beginning. First of all, I'll mention that I've never run for politics before. I've never been a politician until now. I guess I'm counted as one now. And it might have been a little naive of me not to go out and raise money in the beginning, but I chose not to. I wanted to focus on policies and, and getting to know the people of Nevada better and, and doing it that way. I don't think that we necessarily need to vote for a person just because they've raised a lot of money. Now, granted, the, the more money you raise, the more media exposure you can get, and the, you can get out there and get people to know you. But money doesn't always solve the problem. So it certainly helps, and I just... Can you think of an example in the United States Senate race in the last couple of cycles where money has not been incredibly important? And I'm not saying whether that's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying that money is an incredibly important part of running for the United States Senate. Well, we still have an opportunity to raise money now. We still have 90 days left till the primary. It might be a little bit late. People's pockets might be a little empty from the prior giving. But I will say that I have not known of anybody running for the U.S. Senate to did it on a, on a nickel or a dime. They had to have significant funds. Uh, there are instances, and we've seen this recently, in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, somebody was a truck driver and they won the state Senate seat on $5,000 or some, some small amount like that. But it's a lot different when the United States Senate is 50-50 right. um, and every seat is important um, that there's going to be an incredible amount of money coming into the state. That's correct. And, and especially with the, the outside PAC money that comes in, um, there's going to be tremendous amounts of money flowing to both sides. And so if you're not you know, considered in that, that money reign, how do you convince those PACs to come in and support you? Because it's going to be minimum $100 million spent in this state, which is insane. But $100 million with two major population centers um, over the next, you know, eight months. Right. 
So getting through the primary, obviously, is the first objective. Once I get through the primary, then I'm sure the money will flow. If many of you don't know that PACs can't give to individual candidates like myself at this point, it has to be small dollar donations from individuals. If you owned a flower shop or a tire shop, you can't write a check to my campaign. It has to come from your name, Bob Smith's checking account. It can't come from corporations like it can for other state offices. So we're dealing with smaller amounts. And you're right, we've had candidates that have done very well with those small amount dollar donations nationwide. However, um, there are some issues in the way that it's raised and the, the things that were done to get there, and I don't want to get too, too vocal on that right now, but I don't agree with the way that that money was raised. Uh, do you want to give an example? Because you raised the issue. I think you should uh, explain what you're talking about. All right, well, I'm a, I, had my, my head, I had my site up there earlier. I'm a straight shooter. That's my little logo and tagline, and I don't want to offend anybody here. But when you go out and, and tell a lie or exaggerate, uh, your, and, and your, your, you feel that you've been violated by the First Amendment, it doesn't, the First Amendment doesn't give you the right to lie or, or embellish the truth to get donations from individuals. And if you create fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the minds of everybody across the country, and you've got people in Missouri and Florida and Arkansas contributing $50, $60 to a campaign because they feel that the First Amendment rights are at stake over something that was, was contrived and planned for and ready for, I think that's fraud. Okay, and so you're referring to Sam Brown when you bring that issue up. Yes. And, and you believe that whole issue was contrived? I was told it was contrived by one of his former campaign people that left the campaign. Well, I'll, but, I'll, but, leave, but, I'll leave it sit there because... But I'm not a reporter, so... There are obviously people that would disagree with you on that. Okay, but yep. Let's move on. So on your website, um, you said, as your representative in the United States Senate, you'll bring real change through common sense legislation. Give us an example or two of common sense legislation. Yeah, so common sense legislation can revolve around things that I feel are most important to this country. So aside from having a strong military, we have to improve our economy. And I think that we can improve our economy by having a healthy relationship between industry and education. If you look at Nevada in particular, and there's a lot of states that fit this as well, they need a diversified uh, way of making money. It can't be all gaming and mining it has, and tourism. It has to be a diversified economy. So in order to get a diversified economy, I would propose legislation that involves both industry and education so that we provide the job force that's needed to attract industries to Nevada that are higher technology industries, things that are dealing with clean energy, biotech, things of that nature that we need um, to have a diversified economy in, in Nevada. So that's one piece of legislation that uh, I would think okay. about. Okay, do you not believe that that's already currently occurring? I mean, you look at northern Nevada, for example, I mean, we are so diversified that we bounce right back after the whole COVID situation. It was unbelievable how quickly uh, northern Nevada bounced back. Southern Nevada is booming um, at this point. Um, I'm not sure we can take too much more in terms of diversification. We don't have the workforce um, to be able to accommodate what we currently have. So, you know, how would you address that? So and wouldn't that be better as a state issue rather than as a federal issue? Well, it can be a state issue, but it's also a federal issue because there's other states that need that type of legislation as well. So something that's done at the federal level that, that raises all states to the level that they need to be to have a diversified income. Just because we're somewhat successful in Nevada, and we're not totally successful in all of Nevada with that, but we have to be able to use that model so that every state can, why can't Idaho participate in this? Why can't Montana participate in this? So there's other things that need to be done across the country to make us stronger economically. Yeah, I, I would challenge your remark, though. I think that it's very difficult to find places in Nevada, including Pahrump, where you come from, that aren't booming at this point in time. You look at the housing prices, and it's right. just crazy. Um, all right. Um, give us another example of legislation. Well, the other legislation would, again, going back to our strong military, you know, we need to do a better job of taking care of our veterans, as an example. And the reason I mention that is that if you want a strong military, you have to make sure that you're encouraging people to come into the military that realize that there's a pathway for them once they leave. So let's say they've served 10 years or 20 years, whatever it might be. They need to be sure that the VA is taking care of them and that if they have a medical need or there's something else that we can do for them as they transition into civilian life, that they're supported. If a veteran feels that they're not being properly supported or might potentially not be pro properly supported once they leave, you might get less quality people to join the military. So I think that's another piece that, of legislation that we need to work on. Um, 
you know, you, you talk also on your website, uh, you say that Americans deserve more from elected officials, intelligent solutions instead of noise. Be specific. Well, we need to do a better job of making sure that we get honest and reputable people in Washington, D.C. that are actually, like I said earlier, able to actually get the job done and, and actually produce results for the American people. Americans deserve to get a return on their investment in their all of their elected staff, whether it's a senator, a, a congressman, congresswoman, or any other local and state office. We need to do better. Americans deserve more. They deserve to be able to trust their government, and we need to make sure that our elected officials are upholding the standards that we expect them to. You know, the, the average American is very hardworking, honest, and all of those things, those attributes that are good American values, not Republican values or Democrat values, American values. And we all know what those are, honesty, integrity, you know, uh, be a good neighbor, all of those things that make us good people are the things that we want to see in our elected officials. We don't want to see um, extremism, you know, pandering for extremism and, and getting attention from the media or whatever it is they're trying to do. You know, this, this left and right, far left and far right stuff and the way the media handles everything is out of control. Okay, so one of the, and you, you come to the other point I wanted to make. Um, uh, in that same sentence you were talking uh, on your website about, um, you talk about coalition building among both parties. So what areas do you think there is common ground between Republicans and Democrats that you would be in favor of furthering if you were sent to Washington, D.C.? Sure. So I think all Americans, all Americans actually understand that we deserve, and I mentioned this earlier, that we all deserve more out of our elected officials. So in doing so, if everybody was to participate in our government, vote, and vote your conscience, not necessarily vote what you, it seems to be popular at the moment when you're at a rally or you're, you know, you're, you're pumped up and things like that. You've got you to gotta remember, when you sit down at the voting booth or you're at your table, when the, your paper ballot comes, so whichever way you decide you want to vote, you have to make sure that we're putting the person in office that has honesty and integrity behind the, everything that they do, what they've done in life, what they've done on the campaign especially. We look at candidate integrity. We look at, we look at voter integrity and making sure that as a participant in this entire process this, that we call America, that we make sure that we put the elected officials in place that, that will get the job done. Okay, so, and that includes Democrats? As far as? As in the inclusion in that list, if they, they hit all those qualifications, but they happen to be Democrats, because you're saying that you, you, know, you want to see coalition building among both parties. We're a two-party system, and there are Democrats and there are independents that have great ideas, so. I'm not an anti-Democrat, I'm not anti-independent, I'm not anti-Republican. I'm saying that we're Americans and we have to figure out a way to cooperate with each other to get more done. There are too many times when we're, this whole country split, the whole country split, and even our own Republican Party split. You know, we have people calling people rhinos, we have people pointing fingers, calling names. We have too much of that going on. Let's come together as America, let's quit, let's quit the inner, inner, inner fighting that we have going on with our own party so our party can succeed. How long has it been since Nevada has had a successful run in, in the Republican Party? Look at what's been going on for the last 10 years. Yeah, I know we had uh, the wave in 2014. We have a wave now, but we have to protect that. We have to make sure that we take advantage of that, but we have to do it ethically. And that's where we have to leave it. Bill Hochstedler. We'll see you on the campaign trail. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Hochstedler, and my website, just so I can plug that real quick, my website does not have my name on it like other candidates in all the other races. My website is victory2022.org. I do that because we're achieving a victory in 2022.org. This campaign is about all of us. It's not about me. I didn't put Bill Hochstedler for Senate on my website. It's victory2022.org. Please check it out. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Bill. We're going to take just a two-minute break, and Bill's going to run a video, and then we'll have the next Attorney General speak. Bill, you ready?
home people too late. Just maybe hold the mic up. You ready, Bill? Huh? Moving on forward, I'll let Sam get up on the stage. Then. The next candidate, I don't think most of you know who it is. Segal Chada is going to be our next Attorney General. Sam, take it away. All right. So, you know, if this were a, a mixed martial art fight, you just won. I think so, because... Can you hear me? It's on. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, now All everybody right. could hear me. Now they can hear you. That's right. Okay. So, Sigal Chada for Attorney General. So, people are aware from the news stories and, you know, social media, but give us a little background on you, where you come from, your, a little bit of your life history, how you ended up as an attorney, Give us, give us the lowdown here. Okay, so I feel this is like the sequel for you and I, right? It is. So, this is part two. Um, the questions I, was, I didn't get to ask. All right, yeah, you get to make them all up now. Um, so I was born in Israel, uh, moved to Nevada when I was 14 years old, um, went to high school in Las Vegas, graduated from Valley High School, went to UNLV for college. Um, they didn't have a law school in Nevada when I graduated from college in 97. So I had to go out of state. Um, I went to law school at Widener University in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And then um, during the time of while I was in law school, I uh, studied in Switzerland. And um, I wanted to be an international human rights attorney. So um, I very quickly realized that international human rights lawyers don't make as much money as private sector lawyers. So um, I came back and uh, moved back to Las Vegas, uh, worked at a small boutique law firm, and in 2002, started my own practice, and the rest is history. All right, so um, tell us about the experience of growing up in Israel, because that's a unique culture. I've been there, it's a beautiful country, but it has an amazing lifestyle. It does have an amazing lifestyle. Um, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, that being said, it is neighbored by enemies. Um, Lebanon to the north, Syria, and um, Egypt, and Jordan. Well, Jordan is now at peace with Israel, and so is Egypt. But for most of my childhood, Israel was at war with their neighbor. Um, so, and what did that mean for a kid? Well, you know, I mean, for example, my seventh and eighth grade class was in a bomb shelter. Now, when you grow up in that environment, that seems completely normal to you. But um, when you move to the United States and you tell people, well, my seventh and eighth grade was in a bomb shelter, people are like, what do you mean? You know, it's, it's just completely, it's a completely different upbringing. Um, I don't necessarily think that I have post-traumatic stress disorder um, because of that, but yeah, it's definitely a difference in culture, um, you know, and uh, you experience certain things, you know, like um, when there's wars, you know, they give out atropine, which, you know, in the case of, you know, we, we saw what happened in Syria with sarin and everything, and, you know, it's just they, the culture and the population is used to certain 
things over there. So I was surprised when I went to Israel and was uh, staying at a friend's condominium there um, that they had a room that you went to in the case there was a gas attack. Yeah, it's a, it's a safe room. I, I, that was shocking to me because <laughs> you, you think of Israel you know, as, as a modern society that would be similar to what we would exist with in the United States, and yet the reality there is different. Uh, the reality, if you go to a grocery store, a supermarket, that they're liable to have uh, bomb detectors that they look under your car. Oh, you, before you have into to show the, your purse. Right. You so have I to, mean, yeah, you, you know, I mean, so um, anytime you go to a mall in Israel, anytime you walk into a store in Israel, um, there's always security at the door, and um, they do a purse. So if I were to walk into a supermarket, I'd have to open up my purse and make sure that there's nothing that is explosive in my purse. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a different way of life. But again, you grow accustomed to it. You know, that's not something that is, it's hard to explain in America, but when you grow up in that environment, you know, you, it, you just, you know, you brought up the safe room. Um, you know, my grandmother would always fight us when we would have to seal a room. And, you know, it's, it was an older generation and they survived things without safe rooms. And so, you know, these, but the, again, these are things that in America wouldn't even make sense. So as a kid growing up, you're essentially surrounded by enemy countries, um, constant threat of war. Um, so did that help develop your attitude, which is, um, if I might use the phrase, a take no prisoners attitude? I think so. I think most Israelis are, have that attitude. Um, look, they live in a society uh, that the, I guess, imminent destruction and imminent death is just one bus bomb away. And, you know, it toughens you up. You deal with realities that an American teenager would never deal with, you know, so absolutely. Um, this is your first run for a political office, it correct? It is, yes. So I ask you a similar question, which is, why make the first run for the top job? Well, the top law job. Correct. Yeah. So I mean, let's face it, the attorney general is the head of the largest law correct. firm in the state of Nevada. And also the top cop and the top prosecutor of the state. So as an attorney, this is the only job that I find myself that I could execute to the fullest degree. Um, and why I would have done that is because I think the past two years that we've seen with COVID regulations and mandates um, that I've really fought the governor every step of the way. Um, and lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Okay, so let me ask you this. Let me stop you for a second. What inspired you to do that? Why, why did that become your calling? So, you know, when you move to this country, you have the American dream. I mean, I was 14 years old. My parents moved me here. I didn't really have a choice. But when I turned 18, I had the choice. And I still have the choice today. And I think that America is the greatest country in, in the world. And I think Nevada is the greatest state in the country. So, um, <laughs> so I think, you know, what, what inspires me as an immigrant to this country is you have this thing called the Constitution. And when you come from a country that you don't have that thing called the Constitution, um, and keep in mind, my whole career has been based on the Constitution, okay? Whether it was search and seizure issues, whether it was motions to suppress, whether it was tainted evidence, whether it was fruit of the poisonous tree. All these things are based on your constitutional rights. So when I see a leader of my state violating that very thing that is, the, it's the beacon of American foundation, that's when I decided to act. So had you already decided to run for attorney general when you were making these moves? No, no. So, so what, what, all right, <laughs> no. so, so, so what inspired you, first of all, to take the leap into uh, to taking those two cases, the, the kids wearing masks in school and the church? Well, okay, so the kids wearing masks in school was like my sixth or seventh case, okay? My first case was representing four businesses. It was a class action lawsuit um, that was filed in the United States District Court in Southern Nevada, and um, it triggered 
It was triggered because of the fact that the governor decided these businesses were essential and these businesses were non-essential. And in my mind, I thought the only people that could determine whether your business is essential or not are your customers, not the governor of Nevada and not the president of the United States. So again, it is, I saw it as a due process issue and I decided that I, it was just not gonna happen under my watch. And as an attorney, I have the gift of a law license, and I have that ability to go up against the governor and sue him. Okay, and what was the result in that particular case? So that particular case had to be dismissed because um, there, there was a Supreme Court ruling, and it was, um, it was against the church in California. And, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still on the bench. The split was a different split. And at the end of the day, what they decided was the executive branch had the ability and the right to make decisions during pandemic. So we had no option. We really had no option. Um, look, when under American jurisprudence, the Supreme Court of the United States is the highest authority of the land. If the Supreme Court says that executive, that the executive branch has that ability, you follow that as a lawyer. Okay. Um, but let's go to Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel was filed and made its way through this system after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. So when RBG died and we got a new appointment, essentially what had happened was the structure of the court changed. The court tilted right. So that case um, of South Bay Pentecostal Church from California had all of a sudden become not as strong. And then we had another case, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court took up um, the case of uh, Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo. And the decision in Roman Catholic Diocese came out two weeks before I had my oral arguments in the Ninth Circuit. And that was it. It was the hand of God. So um, literally. When, when <laughs> When you mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you sounded like you had admiration in your voice. You know, I mean, as a, as a woman, there is admiration, okay? Um, her policies and her ideologies, I didn't condone, okay? Um, you know, I'll tell you what, I've, you know, Calvary Chapel was not the first case that I argued in the Ninth Circuit. And um, depending on the case argued in the appellate circuits, I always chose the, whether those were dissenting opinions or the concurring opinions or the you know, decisions of, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, my practice a lot consisted of criminal defense. And um, I remember I argued a case that Sotomayor was the dissenting opinion. Now, I have nothing even remotely similar with the ideology of Sotomayor, but for that purpose, yes, I used her dissenting opinion in an oral argument in the Ninth Circuit. So what does that say to you about the Supreme Court of the United States, um, that decisions are made on the basis of law and the Constitution rather than necessarily political parties? Look, the Supreme Court of the United States, what it, it serves, I think, the most important branch. And, you know, I'm a little jaded because I'm a lawyer, right? So to me, all things law are important. Um, so when we look at the structure of the Supreme Court and we look at the way the Supreme Court leans, it is their purpose, okay, to look at the Constitution. And I could tell you, I'm an originalist, I'm a textualist. So I read the Constitution for the document that it is, okay? Um, you take somebody like Sotomayor, or you take somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or you take somebody like Kagan, okay? And they believe that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that needs to be modified and modified with time. I don't agree with that. So it depends how the Supreme Court is structured to, you know, and now with Breyer's retirement, you know, the first thing when I saw the nominee, 
um, or I guess she she looks like she's going to be the nominee. Um, one of the, I think my first tweet was, oh, she's gonna blend perfectly with Sotomayor and Kagan. Now, if I were a 25-year-old law student now, um, I would tend to believe that the place that you will see the most change and most opportunity is in the criminal justice sphere because of the fact that you will now have three Supreme Court justices that are very progressive, okay, cases about, you know, I talked about motions to suppress, defund the police, civil rights is gonna be huge. So we're gonna see a shift, I think, in those areas. Do you think, just as an aside, that the defund the police movement is gone, that it's, it's not palatable to anybody, let alone Republicans or Democrats, it's not palatable to anybody? We've seen the effects of it. You know, um, do I think it's gone? No, I think it's just beginning. And that is one of the reasons I'm running to be the top cop. Where, where do you, where do you th see the support for that? Because it seems as though um, seeing the problems in our society uh, in here in Nevada and across the country, um, the, the insanity in the Bay Area right now with smash and grabs, with um, stores being invaded by gangs of people, to the point where the mayor has to bring in uh, additional police so that Christmas shopping is become safe and secure once again. Um, I, I don't see where defund the police um, when it's in a liberal state and a, a, the most liberal city, um, how it can stand up. Well, respectfully, Who, who's, who's pla who's respectfully I disagree. No, and that's and I'll tell you why. Of course. Okay? Because if you look at, and let, let's just take Nevada, okay? as the state, all right? In the last legislative session, I think we saw the most redundant pieces of legislation come out of the AG's office. One was the Breonna Taylor Act um, and the Pattern and Practices Act over our police departments. And um, when, when you look at that, and the redundancy comes from the fact that, first of all, um, I have talked to so many in law enforcement and the policy of no knock warrants was dead. So when you pass redundant legislation like that, there's no, there's no point, right? Patterns and practices and oversight over officer involved shootings and you know, oversight over internal affairs and ensuring that the police departments um, follow procedures is not the place of the attorney general, okay? Every sheriff's office, every county, every police department has an internal affairs, okay? There's no reason for that oversight, other than the fact that there is, you're trying to clip the wings of the police department, okay? So now, another thing, but look oh, at the, okay. the trajectory. Hang on, hang on one okay. second. So, so you feel <laughs> that in, internal affairs um, is there to clip the wings? No. And I'm talking oh. about the patterns and practices of legislation. Okay. I, I yeah. just wanted no, to clear no, no, that no. up because that's what no. it sounded like. No, no, no. So, but the, is there a politician in this state, um, to be specific about Nevada, that you believe is running on a defund the police stand at this point? I think that the defund the police is a, it's a generic term. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that qualified immunity is going to be the next thing that gets killed for our police officers. And if you don't see that in the trajectory, then you're missing a huge, huge aspect. And do I think that the AG's office, the current AG, will sanction that and will allow that to happen? Absolutely. Qualified immunity is the first thing that we're going to see come out of the cops. Okay, so to you then, defund the police is not an actual monetary situation, it's more a philosophy. It's, it's more of an ethos, okay? And um, whether it's obstructing and interfering with a police department's ability to investigate and ensure public safety, um, and when we look at qualified immunity, and I know that's coming down the pike, and everybody else should know that that's gonna come down the pike. Um, but when we look at that, and we look at that ethos that we see out of this AG's office, um, it's, it's also the mentality 
of um, we're going to see the largest police attrition. And we haven't even scratched the surface yet. If qualified immunity is something that gets negotiated and gets put on the table, you will not have one police officer willing to take a bullet for the public. Um. The reforms that were passed in the last legislative session were pretty much uniformly opposed uh, by the police chiefs and the DAs. Um, do you think their voices are going to be heard louder going forward? When I'm AG, I will be the top cop and ensure that their voices will be heard, and I will be the top cop that will be hawkish and back the police departments and the chiefs. Okay. <laughs> What are your concerns when the governor has an $8.5 million war chest, despite innumerable negatives against him, um, that is still a huge war chest. If you were to become the AG, but Steve Sisolak were to be reelected as governor, what scenario would that create for you? It'll make for a very interesting four years in office. <laughs> I promise you that. Um, what would, look, at the end of the day, there's, there's, a, there's a conflict in what the AG can do, okay? And I'll give you the perfect example. Aaron Ford had an obligation to the state of Nevada. He is the people's lawyer, okay? The conflict is, is that at the same time he's the people's lawyer, he is also supposed to represent the governor, okay? Now, I'll give you another example. Right now, um, you know, I'm representing a, the re repair the vote pack, okay? Um, that is something that is the people's petition, okay? Every lawsuit that I filed has been the people's lawsuit. Now, you have to do with checks and balances as to who do you serve as the AG? Do you serve your governor or do you serve your people? And I think you serve your people. And when your governor is wrong, you have to sue your governor. And it's the same thing with the Biden administration. Um, let's go back to one of my earlier questions, which is, um, you know, in your dealings with COVID cases, um, how did it come about that you got involved with the students and masks? Because I think that um, Republican or Democrat, more people are going to be angry over their children and lost years in school, lost proms, lost games. I think this is a huge issue, and you were at the forefront of this. I was, I was at the forefront, and you know, the case out of all my cases that I've argued in front of the Ninth Circuit, in the, in the federal system, um, in the state system, um, even out of state, um, and I've litigated some very challenging cases, um, the, the mask mandate case, I think, is the one that I took a thousand lashes on. Um, I, we had a very activist judge who was, you know, for 45 minutes, I was bombarded with policy questions, not legal questions, questions like, do you believe there is a pandemic? Okay, that's not the judge's place. Th those are not, as a arbiter, you are supposed to look at the law, ask me questions about the law, ask me how to apply the facts of my case to the law, okay? Um, so th the mask mandate case was something that resulted because I have two children in Clark County School District, okay? So coming off of closures um, and distance learning, they were finally able to go to school. And then the science comes out. And then when I filed the lawsuit, 34 states did not have mask mandates. So what science am I supposed to follow as a lawyer? Am I supposed to follow the majority of the states that don't have mask mandates and their students are going to school on masks? Or do I follow Steve Sisolak science? I made the decision that I'm going to follow the 34 states, and I sued the governor. And what was, and what was the response from the public to you? So, 
you know, keep in mind that the mask mandate lawsuit was filed September of last year, okay? Um, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Almost instantly, my office was bombarded with individuals that had heard that, you know, I was the ballsy lawyer, you know, the one that would stand up to Sisolak. And um, it, it was just very overwhelming. I was getting phone calls from people at least two, three times a week. Can you sue Dieter for us? We haven't gotten our checks, you know, and, and it's just, and when there's such a public outcry, you know, you wonder, where is the attorney general to protect the state? So, you know. Do you believe the attorney general had a, a role to play in the mask mandate? I think he collaborated, absolutely. I think he is, look, you know, the, the, this administration is comprised by people that collaborated and colluded to shut down the state, to harm business. Um, and I'm using words that, you know, are legal terms because that is the truth of what happened, okay? You had, you know, one of the lawsuits that I filed was to reopen, you know, the legislature. Um, it, 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 there was absolute collaboration and collusion, okay? Nicole Between? Can Nicole Canizero, Brenda Erdos, Steve Sisolak. We talk about legislation like, you know, AB 321. How does that even get passed? Okay, I mean, we see bills getting passed in the middle of the night. I mean, you know, people could say whatever they want about lobbyists, but at the end of the day, okay, they are there to, to um, protect the public's interest, testify on legislation, and when they were shut out of the building, that is the people's building. So I sued them. Um, last question here. We could go on for another hour, but... I know, I'm sorry. We, no, 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 we're fine. Um, uh, the governor's state of emergency, it looks like that's likely coming to an end. Um, what did you think about this two-year state of emergency? Have you ever seen a state of emergency for two years? You know, so let, let's go back to your question about, you know, how it was to grow up in the Middle East, okay? Um, there was an Egyptian leader, Hosni Mubarak, okay? We all remember Mubarak. You know, um, and during the Arab Spring, Mubarak was toppled. And, but I remember thinking to myself, when Steve Sisolak did this, six months in, I'm like, oh my God, Nevada has their own Mubarak. And th so that is the way I looked at it. Now, Mubarak had a 30-year state of emergency until the people engaged in an uprising, okay? But, you know, when we go back to how was it to grow up in the Middle East, these are the flashbacks that I have, you know. And, that, and that's where we have to leave it. I'm um, sorry. Good thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> thank you. We, we had the time. Thank um, you. Good luck on the campaign trail. We'll see you down the road. Thank you very much. Didn't they do a great job? I want to thank Sam for all the interviews. Thank you very much, Ray. And Pleasure our next attorney general. <laughs> and you know she's very shy, right, Sam? Very shy. Unbe if I could have just gotten her to say one or two things, it would have been great. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you again for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here and look forward to doing more with you next month. Yeah, next month, April 7th, here, dinner. Sam will be the moderator of a debate for U.S. Senate and a few other candidates. Anyway, if you want to ask just a couple of questions, notice the word couple, to Seagal that's here or to Bill, stand up and come to the mic. Sandra, do you want to say something? Okay. Anybody want to ask questions? Before we go, I'd like to ask Gall why the Attorney General. You got a pair of so yes, yes, sir. I would like to ask Gall why the Attorney General um, is 
is actually still an employee of, of uh, Eaglet, his former law partner, making him hundreds of millions of dollars over this opioid, opioid uh, thing. So I think uh, we need to give a little bit of background on the opioid litigation, and many people don't know about okay. the opioid litigation. Does everybody know about the opioid litigation and the, and the background? Okay. So essentially what we know is that Nevada is involved in opioid litigation. There was a $2.6 billion settlement that was reached um, about a month and a half ago. Um, the opioid litigation, uh, like many other types of litigation that is engaged on behalf of the state of Nevada and as the Attorney General, the Attorney General has the right to sue on behalf of its citizens. Um, one of the lawsuits that was filed was against the opioid uh, manufacturers and they range everyone, everywhere from Purdue to um, every opioid manufacturer that has impacted the state of Nevada, um, and the way that the, that the law firm was selected, you're supposed to have a neutral selection that is based on a point system. The law firm that was selected and was given an exclusive monopoly to litigate the opioid litigation is Aaron Ford's former law firm, okay? Now, the amount of money that the opioid litigation, when we talk about the $2.6 billion, um, you know, we have 17 counties, and all 17 counties were represented by his former employer. This decision was made six weeks after he took office. Now, when you looked at the point allocation system, there was another law firm that should have gotten, but they never received their Nevada preference points, okay? Now, as the Attorney General, okay, he has the he has the obligation to provide this point allocation, and I will engage in the same thing. I will always give Nevada law firms preference to litigate because I do believe that we've got some amazing law firms um, that engage in mass tort litigation. Um, but one of the things that happened in that, he said that he abstained, but ironically, the law firm that should have gotten it never got its Nevada preference points, and Robert Eglett ended up with the, uh, the opioid litigation, and uh, to the tune of $350 million to that law firm. So they, I, you know, I used to joke, and I used to say, well, Aaron Ford has 350 million reasons to keep me out of office. I, I've got, I have One. a question, Ray. Oh. oh, go ahead. We'll do two, Sandra and one other, and that's it. Okay. Hi, Seagal. Thanks for being here, and it's great seeing you again. But my question, I want to know about your opponent. Is there another opponent in the race that you know of, and what is her donation history? So um, I do have an opponent. I was lucky enough to run uh, for quite a while unopposed, and two weeks ago, I think it's two or three weeks ago, um, another attorney stepped into the race. Um, I do believe that this is an attorney that was put up by the Democrats, no different than um, we saw happen to Sue Loudon in the senatorial race. Um, it was, you know, I tell people, imagine if Sue Loudon had won that primary, she would still be our U.S. Senator, and Harry Reid and all his policies would have died in 2012, okay? So um, my opponent happens to be somebody who's donated and maxed out to Harry Reid and Catherine Cortez Masto, and um, during the height of the epidemic, she donated, she maxed out $10,000 to Steve Sisolak. So while I was suing him, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, okay, the person who decided to jump into my race actually ratified every action that he took and gifted him with max donations, okay? Now, it's all 
public, okay? One of the things that uh, is beautiful about our state is the transparency that the Secretary of State CNE reports provide us. So another example is, you know, we as lawyers uh, often litigate and uh, befriend uh, all kinds of lawyers. So while I have many lawyers, lawyer friends that are friends of mine and colleagues of mine, um, you will not find any donations to Democrats from me. And the reason is, no matter how friendly we might be in the courtroom or outside of the courtroom, my ideologies are my ideologies, and I will not compromise those ideologies. And my friends understand that. And my friends understand that. Um, and I think they respect that. Um, and one of the examples that we could see is, you know, my opponent constantly, constantly put money in Democrats' pockets instead of, you know, betting on the Republicans. And we saw that during Ross Miller's campaign um, against Adam Laxalt, she maxed out to Ross Miller, okay? Now, Ross Miller and I have tried cases together. We are friends. As a matter of fact, at the end of the last case that we tried together, we were on the same team working 18 hours a day together. And when he, he knew that when we were done with trial, he was going to start campaigning, he would never see some money from me, nor my vote, because ideology is ideology. And that's where I stand, and my opponent, unfortunately, again, we saw that with... It's, it's the same thing that happened in 2012 with Sue Loudon. You know, the Republicans for Reed didn't want her in office. They were scared of what she would do. And the same thing is happening to me right now. It's just the sequel. By the way, just so you know, we had invited Trish to debate Seagal, but she had a previous commitment, which I won't tell you Seagal's comment to that. I said it was very record. direct. <laughs> One more question, if anybody wants to ask, before we leave. You can ask Bill. I didn't hear you. What? Yeah, Trish. Yeah, we'll reach out to several people after I'll they be available file. anytime. I'll clear All right. my calendar for Don't that. forget a couple of reminders. The Washoe GOP, the 12th, right? At Boomtown. And then Pulse Jackson tomorrow, first Friday, starts at 6 o'clock. Paul's buying for everybody. Yeah. So, so you all know that Seagal's a new candidate. What she didn't ask any of you was, I'm running for office, contribution. Money. I'm the only guy. <laughs> so if you can, if you can give her whatever you can give her, and I don't. I'm just a volunteer. If you can give her whatever you get her. I maxed out. So and I think she's the greatest. We got. Her and Unfortunately, I'm a trial lawyer. I'm a one-trick pony. All I know how to do is sue people. So I haven't quite grasped the. Uh, yet. I have a website, chatterfornevada.com. Um, my team is here. You could get my information. Um, I'm, you know, very transparent. Uh, my cell number is on my website. I will talk to you about anything and all things the law and lawsuits. And, you know, that's my passion. And I will be your next AG. And I promise that. The one last comment that she needs money. Oh. Going to echo the man George here and uh, say we, we do need contributions. Uh, we are a grassroots field campaign and need all boots on the ground. We'll be having a fundraiser on Wednesday, March 16th at uh, Midtown Spirits at 5.30 p.m. Please uh, talk to Seagal or John Shiner, campaign manager, to get more information. There's also flyers on your table. Thank you so much.
I just your faith. No, I know. So people start. Well, come to the event. Melissa. She's awesome. I've got such a.